Hello, I'm Patricia Kranz, the Executive Director of the Overseas Press Club. Sorry, too loud. And um, thank you all for coming. Um, we have information on the table out there about um, upcoming events and our Dateline magazine and our uh, bulletin. So please feel free to take those. And um, we are very happy tonight to um, have this panel. And I will introduce the moderator, um, Jacqueline Albert Simone, and then she will take it from there. So please go, Jackie. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for coming on a cold, uh, freezing, whatever night. It's good of you all to be here. Before we talk about the program, of course I want to talk on the part of the OPC uh, about Bob Simon. What a terrible loss. <laughs> Such an extraordinary man, an extraordinary journalist, someone whom we treasured, whom all of America learned to love, respect, and admire. Admire for his integrity and his courage. So I will just take a moment before I tell you about our program, why we just pay tribute to Bob as we knew him. Last year, Bob won the President's Award from the then president of the OBC Club, Mike Serrell. Patty, Patty Krauss, our executive director, has put all that information on the first page of our web page. Uh, you can even pick up his speech last year, which was such an indication of what a great guy he was. So here's to Bob, and may we all live in peace. Mm -hmm. That was hard to do. So I'm going on to the program, which came to me soon after the event. And I thought, yes, there is a difference. What is the difference? And how does that translate? And so I thought we should have an American cartoonist and a European one, as you know, Sidney Wilkinson. Felipe Galindo, and the editor-in-chief of Frost Emery. So Sydney is going to start, and she's going to show us cartoons and talk about Sydney's a symbol. Sydney is one, has won three OPC prizes, has awards. She has spoken at our dinner, has spoken wonderfully, and also, to our credit, and to hers particularly, she was the first woman cartoonist to win a Pulitzer Prize. So cheers for that, and Sydney's going to take over. Thank you. Do you need a mic? I don't, I don't think so. You, let me know if you can't hear me. I'll just pretend I'm yelling at my children. <laughs> um, Both of you? Yep. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> it's coming. There we go. Okay. We do love modern technology. Um, I'm Signe Wilkinson, and I'm going to talk about uh, cartooning from my perspective as a cartoonist who turns out six cartoons a week uh, for the Philadelphia Daily News and Inquirer, uh, which is quite a different way of doing cartoons than uh, Charlie Hebdo. Um, but let me just start by <laughs> saying my cartoons don't kill people. Cartoons can't cut off someone's head. They can't 
incinerate someone in a cage. They cannot, um, they cannot uh, throw you off a cliff. But cartoons obviously um, can get under people's skin. And uh, cartoonists, uh, particularly, I think we should um, remember it, it, this being Overseas Press Club, have really, long before Charlie Hebdo, um, taken uh, a lot of real physical harm for their, uh, for their cartoons. In particular, in 2011, Ali Farzat in Syria uh, ended up that way by the Syrian troops who, um, and nobody knows exactly who ordered it, but they abducted him either from his car or his house, it's a little unclear, took him out uh, into uh, beside a road, beat him up and stomped on his hands until his hands were broken. And this is his own self caricature <laughs> to, um, Show how he felt about it, and the, and that this would this would not stop him for, from cartooning. But this is uh, this is extreme. Uh, this is an extreme reaction uh, that didn't get anywhere near the Charlie Hebdo uh, publicity. But uh, we cartoonists noted um, this week the cartoonist Zunar from Malaysia was. Uh, uh, arrested in his house and is now in jail in Malaysia because of his criticism of the government. Um, mostly political criti criticism, but Mal in Malaysia uh, there are laws that say that people who are not Muslim cannot say the word Allah. And so he has done cartoons like this. Malaysia, Allah, other countries all laugh. And he has ridiculed his country merci uh, merci mercilessly. He's extremely popular, and now he's in jail, <coughs> although he's supposed to get out shortly, I'm happy to say. Fortunately, in the United States, we have the First Amendment, for which I am incredibly grateful. And it was uh, even extended more vigorously for cartoonists, thanks to my favorite pornographer, Larry Flint, who <laughs> sued his way all the way to the Supreme Court and won a um, unanimous decision that basically said, cartoons are humor, they're jokes, get over it. You can't, you can't take them seriously. Uh, well, you can take them seriously, but you can't um, sue over them. They're, they are humor. Uh, fortunately, I've never um, been taken out and had my, my hands stomped, and really most cartoonists in the United States have not faced anything like the persecution people have elsewhere. This is what constitutes a bad day in my office. This is a letter from a reader <laughs> and the cartoon that he didn't like. And, <laughs> I mean, this is a cartoon not about religion, not about politics, but about Mr. Sterling and his clippers, the, uh, the big controversy uh, where I had him in, uh, and some other people of uh, dubious repute. Um, and the, the, my reader was less than uh, impressed. <laughs> so, but um, what does get us in trouble more often is our, our, our very, uh, a small group of issues, and religion is one of them, um, guns is another, abortion is another. Uh, Israel is uh, sure, to get, sure to get a reaction. Um, and the imagery around those issues is uh, in and of itself um, it can be uh, inflammatory in the same way as the uh, Muslim or the I images of Muhammad. But one of the things I want to talk about tonight is that um, people have very selective reactions to symbolism. For example, and this is going, uh, going way back to 1992 when I did this very bad um, but very quick drawing for our little letter. Oops, that's not it. All right, I'm going to just dive in. <laughs> this is um, this is the pro-life Jesus, and this this came after a, a 
a fundamentalist Christian, uh, took it upon himself to get rid of an abortion doctor down in Florida. Um, so, um, because the doctor was, of course, killing fetuses, and so that was anti-Christian, and so he said uh, Jesus had led him to do it, and I did this cartoon, The Pro-Life Jesus. Um, you would think, after all the bad images of Jesus over the years, <laughs> this wouldn't have gotten people all that upset, but in fact, um, no one was hurt. Uh, many Christians were not amused. And I, I took a lot of uh, a lot of grief from that. I don't usually use images like this just because they are inflammatory. But sometimes you need them, and you need the freedom to be able to pull them out and use them. Um, I also uh, this is uh, another one. I'm going through. I'm going through why I'm hated by most religions. One, one, one year I made it onto the uh, list of ten, or the list of journalists who are most anti-Semitic, most anti-Catholic, and most anti-Muslim. So uh, this, I'm going to give you proof on why I earned my um, place on those lists. This is uh, way back in the early 90s. Yes, I am for choice in education. I am for the state giving your tax money to parents to give to me so I can teach your, their kids to be against choice in abortion. Uh, the, the Catholic Church was not amused <coughs> by this. But my feeling is that when the church goes to the state and asks for money, my money as a taxpayer, they have entered the political realm and again, I need the, the freedom to be able to draw what's happening. Just because they are religious does not protect them from criticism when they're, they're uh, operating uh, in, the, in the political state. Uh, and this isn't new, this controversy. This is a Thomas Nast cartoon from 1871. It's called The American River Ganges. And this, uh, this is an, essentially an anti-Catholic immigration cartoon uh, with the, uh, the priests coming out of the river attacking the good Protestant Americans. Um, this cartoon still irritates people. A couple of years ago, uh, Thomas Nast was proposed to be, to be one of the, um, the favorite sons of New Jersey, which is where he grew up. But because um, Catholic groups uh, protested, he was not given that honor. This, you know, 130 years later. Um, okay, now let's move on to insulting another religion. <laughs> the, this um, was this is the little drawing I, I first mentioned. Um, it, it was. It was a letter, uh, it went with a letter to the editor. It was something about the Middle East, that, uh, which I uh, don't remember the specifics at this, at this moment, but it was clearly about uh, Palestinian aggression against Israel or violence against Israel. And of course, it had the um, Star of David as the site. I got zero complaints on this cartoon, zero. Three. Uh, months later, in this is 1992, there was a um, Senate race going on in which a woman named Liz Yakel, uh, Lynn Yakel, excuse me, um, was running against our Senator Arlen Specter, and it looked like she might have a good chance of unseating him. It was the year of Clinton running, also. Um, so Arlen Specter's camp, we don't know who started a whispering campaign against her that she was anti-Semitic because her uh, Presbyterian <laughs> church had had a uh, panel on the Middle East and included a Palestinian who was critical of Israel. And for that, she was being charged as uh, being anti-Semitic. So I did this cartoon. Again, a tiny cartoon like this big that went on the letters page. Um, and that's Len Yakel on the left. And this nearly got me fired. Uh, people came in saying, you may not use the Star of David in a cartoon. Now remember, this Star of David, okay. This Star of David, not okay. 
And to me, uh, again, the Muhammad, the whole issue on what's sacred and what's not depends on whether it is um, favorable to the group whose, uh, whose uh, symbol it is. Um, ironically, the, one of the effects from this cartoon is that, that people started thinking of Lynn Yakel as a little circus dog. <laughs> and it really ended up hurting her in a, in a subtle way um, long after the, the controversy over the Star of David died down. Radical Islam sponsors the Miss Muslim World Contest, <laughs> Miss Illiteracy, Miss Can't Vote, and Miss Waiting to be Stoned. Um, yes, there was controversy. <laughs> we were picketed. Uh, we were uh, visited by several imams, and uh, this, this created another really uncomfortable several weeks of back and forth about, uh, about whether this was a bigoted cartoon. Um, it was uh, it, Nigeria had the Miss World contest. Uh, there was big controversy that Muslims said it was demeaning and it shouldn't be there. And 70 people died in riots outside. Um, the thing about cartooning in a daily paper is this is one day's cartoon. But there are many things that I cartoon about, and I can go back and do different cartoons uh, using some of the same Im imagery. And actually, I'm some I'm sympathetic with the uh, the Muslims who say Americans dress like whores, you know, because I have two daughters that I had to raise during the Britney Spears age, <laughs> and that was living hell. So this is a cartoon, four parts. I'm taking, this is a stand-in for me, taking my daughter to uh, uh, shopping. Uh, nothing met each other. You could not find anything to cover your cover a teenager's stomach. <laughs> Another one, I get the brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> So you can use the same imagery again. I, nobody complained about this one because it's positive. And so it's how the imagery is, is shown. And this, it was my reaction to the um, Danish cartoons. Um, my paper did not want to publish the, any of the Danish cartoons and did not want me to draw Muhammad. Um, so I stewed over it for a day or two and didn't draw the angry, bitter cartoon that I might have, and then drew this one, the big fat book of offensive religious cartoons, with Muhammad being obviously uh, third from the right. And again, no one complained because Muhammad is happy, he's laughing, he's a good guy. So that's not a problem. It's only a problem if you're being negative to, towards Muhammad. And, and that's my problem with censorship generally. You can't make a, bla a blanket um, rule not to show something because it's always going to be somebody else's judgment over uh, about whether it's positive or negative. And lastly, this is uh, one of my favorite cartoons uh, anywhere and with the lights on you can't really see it but it's a Joseph Kepler cartoon from 1874 from the Harper's Weekly called the religious vanity fair and um, it it denigrates pretty much every religion in America at the time we have the Jew over with the the big knife on the left we have the Catholic sell, selling salvation here we have Mormons, we have Baptists, and we have um, even the um, sort of populist preacher Beach, whose name was Beecher, um, who was you know like the megachurch um, Protestant minister of his day. He also turned out to be an adulterer and uh, a kind of a lush, and so he's he's uh, portrayed. Um, with his uh, his own foibles too, so um, this is nothing new that we um, 
that we look at religion and we look at religion the same way as we do as pol with politics. That um, hypocrisy is hypocrisy, whether you do it in the name of your political party or, or your religious uh, affiliation. So I will go back to my original statement that um, cartoonists don't kill people. Humorless fundamentalists do. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think we could have gotten a better understanding of American cartoonists than what we just heard from Sydney. Uh, I think we all enjoyed that and appreciated it and learned. Uh, next, separating Sydney and Bernini, Gennady, is me, is Winona Pellin, who is the French editor of France Marie, which is probably the only nationally distributed French magazine monthly. Uh, France-Emery also has uh, a weekly e-page e e e uh, giving us all the information about France that we want, and of course, the daily blog. Uh, Granola, who has been living in America for five years, or in New York, in America, New York. For five, in New York for five years, uh, is not only editor-in-chief, of the magazine, but her own particular expertise is in art and culture. So she's very well qualified to talk to us about the history of French cartoons, how she feels about what she would publish in France and Italy, and uh, French humor over the years. Uh, Quinola, do you need my uh, I have one. I'm not sure it's working though. Yeah. No. Is it? Yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> yeah, just keep it close. Yes, it's working. So, so first of all, I just wanted to say that I'm pretty uh, surprised, actually. Uh, I was not expecting to see uh, Mohammed represented in a cartoon. So you can do that and publish it in the US. I'm, I'm pretty surprised. And um, this is, yeah, this is pretty strong. The only thing uh, maybe that we need to, to know that Charlie Hebdo was, uh, it was like the, the journalists of Charlie Hebdo were often referring uh, to Charlie Hebdo as a teenage fanzine. So something really irreverent, uh, something Charlie Hebdo is meant to, to, to be funny, uh, irreverent. They wanted to like shook the institutions uh, that was their, their, their first uh, um, goal. So I'm not sure it's, if we can compare your work and what Charlie Hebdo was doing. I believe that at least the spirit was, uh, was pretty different. Mm -hmm. And you said, like, my cartoons won't kill. Uh, you started to say that. Then we may think right now that, yes, maybe they can do. You're not willing for them to kill, but. I, I don't know how you feel, but you could be endangered, uh, I guess. Yeah, but the cartoon didn't do it. <laughs> Crazy people do it. I mean, <laughs> that is true. You, you know, it's, that is true. And that's, that's a debate that we have right now in France. I was also pretty upset about that because there was a first wave of people uh, mourning the deaths of these people. But then, like maybe two, three days after, people started to say, well, but, you know, they're there to represent uh, Mohammed. Maybe that was not the best time to do it. So maybe, in a way, you know, they had it coming. So I'm really shocked and upset by this kind of attitude because um, you have to know that these people were also always fighting for the rights of uh, immigrants to, to have a way a right to stay in France. They would also defend uh, immigrants' uh, rights to vote, this kind of things. <clears throat> so I'm just thinking these killers uh, didn't pick the right paper. Why didn't they go to, to Minute, which is like a, a obviously fascist and anti-Semit anti and anti-Muslim magazine? Uh, maybe they, they just, you know, they were not sure where uh, Charlie Hebdo's office was 
maybe that they just didn't open the right door, you know. <laughs> then I don't know if you have uh, questions on uh, Charlie Hebdo itself. Well, <clears throat> we will be asking questions later, mm -hmm. but of course I have a question for you. Sure. When you brought up that point, uh, I don't know if everyone can hear you. Speak into the mic, yeah. yeah. Hold the mic closer. Yeah. Yeah. When you brought up that point, yeah, I'll, 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 have that. Have that. Closer. Oh. Closer. And the volume has to go up. Can you all hear me now? No. 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 Closer. Okay. okay. So, so when you brought up that point, about people saying he had it, they had it coming to them. Uh, I have heard that, I have read that, oddly enough, from what I refer to as the fundamentalist left. Instead of the fundamentalist right, uh, in England, that was very noticeable, that the objections of the far left, claiming that they were racist, that was the big issue in that horrible statement they had in coming. So how do you feel, you, you mentioned it, but could you explain more about what the Charlie, what Charlie Hebdo meant to the cartoonists who worked there? I think it, it's really absurd to, to say that they are racist. First, because or they are racist with everybody everything and everyone like for example um, after after they dare to to do to draw mohammed people said all right now if they do it right now it's clearly uh, anti-muslim but it's like this cover in 2014 there was only one cover showing mohammed there were many more showing the pope uh, mocking the pope the the catholics the orthodox jews I mean, anything, the politics as well. They would mock at uh, Sarkozy, at Francois Hollande, like every time. So it's really not pointed uh, at Muslim people or the prophets uh, in particular. Um, also, they would use this uh, cartoon with like very grotesque uh, features, like very big leaves, ugly faces, but for everyone, it's not, again, not one people. Everybody would be looking fat and ugly, smelly, you know, with this very, almost uh, South Park kind of uh, humor, you know, very, yeah, very heavy. You could find it heavy, you could say it's vulgar, uh, it's too much, but it's definitely not racist in, in my mind. Well, if I may, one more question before we move on. Uh, could you give us a little history of the cartoonist mentality through the years, <clears throat> starting even with the revolutionary period, and tell us the story, particularly of Mr. Papillon. You mean, uh, do you refer to like the tradition of satire? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty old, and we used to have the first cartoonists like uh, Honoré Daumier or, um, or Philippon, his editor. Uh, they, they used to go to jail and be fined like all the time because they would mock at the king. They would, there is this very famous caricature of uh, Louis Philippe, the king of France, represented as a as a peer, peer shaped, and that's I mean it, it's just uh, mocking at the physical appearance and the resemblance between the, the peer shape and the king. But even for that, you would go to jail, and that was like that was a earthquake <laughs> because of this drawing. So it has a long, long, long history. And before Charlie Hebdo was another uh, journal uh, which has this motto uh, to be stupid and let me so uh, stupid and mean, you know. So it's a long tradition of uh, of humor uh, as being deliberately offensive in a way. And uh, I think it, it's yeah, it, it, it's it's difficult maybe uh, for some Americans to, to grasp this humor because it's particularly mean and and heavy and uh, like anarchist in a way. And, and one more thing, uh, French humor, French satire has always been bawdy, boisterous, and particularly interested going back to Rebelle, that's going back very far in French history to um, what the Americans call dirty stuff. 
<laughs> and what Burns referred to simply as a symbolism of, uh, I, I think I would have to call it body parts. But um, there were a lot of thought jokes in Jean Yves Duke, right, to say. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Which is so far from what Sydney was talking about. But it is now Felipe Galindo, uh, known as Fago, to any of you who know his work, and some of you must. Uh, Felipe has won so many awards all, all over Europe, right? I'm thinking of Portugal, I'm thinking of Turkey. Uh, I could go on. There are so many I really can't list them. One of his best achievements, final achievements, final, finest achievements, is that out of 2,500 cartoonists, he won uh, an international prize for the best cartoon on climate change. And I'm hoping he's going to show that. Yes. Good. Uh, you may have seen Felipe recently. It's only a, it's only a little over a month since the hideous murder. And Felipe was very much on the air because he is, was a great friend of one of the cartoonists who was murdered, the oldest man and one of the best known and adored in France. But he'll tell us about that. And uh, so Felipe spoke on the CD, uh, on BBC, on CNN, on Channel One, on British television, uh, many more. But it's up to him to speak for him. So, and he's going to now. Thank you. Oh, I have one more thing to say. Sure. <laughs> the has got together, has put together a series of cartoons uh, from cartoonists all over uh, about the event. Uh, he's looking to exhibit them. And if any of you know the space that's available in the next few months, he would be very happy to hear from you. But go ahead. Okay. All yours. Okay. Actually, I'm going to, uh, well, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Jeffrey. Uh, my name is Felipe Galindo Gomez. That's how I have my pen name called Fego. Uh, and I was going to show a little bit of how the French and American humor intertwined because uh, I think we all, we all come from the French tradition of humor and, and British. They are the first who, who started uh, criticizing the kings <laughs> and religion. And I will show the, the cartoon that also you were, you were mentioning. Uh, this is uh, William Hogarth. He began doing these cartoons about, uh, in England in the early, seven, in the early, early 1700s. Uh, mocking everything. That's Britannia there, the seal. I hope I have a good uh, solution. This is Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin. This is the first political cartoon in America about the, the independence of the, either we join or die. This is the colonies. Uh, this is the, the cartoon that Gernot was referring to. Uh, Philippon and, and Domier, they were fined. Actually, later on, they were selling prints because they have to pay so many fines. To, because they were, <laughs> instead of putting them in jail, they, 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 the government keep fining them. But, but still, I mean, this is, I think the French, I, I, I admire a lot uh, French culture because they really are always breaking boundaries, breaking, making people think. Uh, I mean, uh, the revolution uh, really changed the world, the concept when they don't, they didn't respect the kings anymore. So we are all the same. <laughs> so this is, this is another cartoonist uh, from England. The, it's already the France, France and Britain uh, dividing the world. Um, this is in America. It's a, it already cartoonists started doing stuff in America about this is the infant Indian exterminators, the food of our youth. So this is when uh, there were a lot of killings uh, against the Native Americans here. Uh, the Civil War also had a lot of cartoonists uh, making uh, their, their opinions count in, in favor or 
against the union. Uh, another one, another example. In my country, I'm from Mexico originally, and we also have a lot of uh, influence from French cartoons. This is another uh, a very political cartoon, I mean, very critical of, of the Jews in, in, the, uh, in, in America. They are really uh, criticizing them very, very tough. Uh, so uh, the, the, I'm, I'm going to fast forward to the 1960s. But I, as I was going to say, uh, Mexico, for example, also we had a lot of cartoonists uh, at the time of when, when there was a, separate, a separation between church and state. And so in a way, we all cartoonists come from the French and the, and the British tradition of criticizing the, the, the ills of society, the kings. And, but for example, in America, in the 19, this is 1950s, uh, younger cartoonists were criticizing the American way of life. And this created a, a, a lot of influence all over the world. And uh, I mean, this is what they do now. Mad Magazine has been around for so many years. And I mean, they keep doing, this is the only satirical uh, publication that is still uh, doing uh, mocking the American way of life and everything. So yes, we can't. Right? So, so um, at the same time, in the 1960s, uh, the underground comics came into scene. But this was more humor about uh, drugs and rock and roll and love. And Robert Crumb was very influential on that. But all this, as I said, it's permeating also other cultures in Europe, in Latin America. And in Europe, uh, this is later, this is in the 1970s, a great magazine called National Lampoon. They really missed that magazine. They were really, really satirical. I think that they were the closest to Charlie Hebdo here in America. And uh, if you don't buy this magazine, we'll kill this dog. They were really, really good. And when I was growing, <laughs> I was growing up in Mexico. I, I was like 13 years old. I saw this magazine. I said, I want to move to New York to publish cartoons there. That was basically one of my <laughs> the reasons. And in France. With the, with the events of the 1960s, they, a lot of magazines came in, in, the, in the scene. This is before Charlie Hebdo was Harakiri Hebdo. And they were, that this, is, uh, this is when the, the, the satirical humor starts in, in, in France. Uh, they were banned because there was this, they did this uh, publication, Bal Tragic a Colombe. It's a tragic, uh, uh, how do you say ball? Uh, yes, a dance. Uh, one more. It's when Charlie Charles de Gaulle died. Uh, there was a major event. But in the same town, his in the same hometown, there was a disco who was on fire, and 176 people died. And they, they the president really paid much attention. So they they Charlie, I mean uh, Harakiri criticized that, and they were banned. So they came back. And with the name Charlie Hebdo, Charlie for Charles de Gaulle, this is what Wolinsky told me, and Hebdo means weekly. So they came up, and also an, an, as an homage to Charlie Brown, because there was a magazine called Charlie Menzuela or Charlie Brown. So you see, there is a cross-pollination of humor all over the world, in America and Europe. And as I said, even in Mexico, I knew about these, these magazines when I was in college. Uh, Mexico has a, a big tradition of political humor, so we're always looking for this kind of, of inspiration for, for our own work. Uh, Cine is another great cartoonist who was really more critical than, than the Charlie Hebdo team. In fact, he was fired from Charlie Hebdo because he, because he was very anti-Semitic. Uh, Sarkovsky's son was going to marry a, a woman from a Jewish family, and he was doing vicious cartoons and they said no you cannot do this we, we're not going to attack in that senseless way so uh, but he he was also part of the scene of the political cartoons in in, in france i don't know what he's doing now but he's also at this in the same uh, age of, of wolinsky he, he has a, his own magazine now his own magazine? called uh -huh. cine Ebdo. Oh, yeah, cine oh but okay it's, the circulation is really really low yes because he used to have his own magazine this one is cinema massacre yeah. And at the same time, he was very popular in America with a little book of cats. 
uh, he was doing uh, expression names with a chat, with the C-H-A-T. Beautiful little book. I mean, uh, so as an artist, you can go the whole spectrum. It's, you can be very, very political, and you can be very, very sweet at the same time. <laughs> These are some samples of Charlie Hebdo, who is always, uh, they were mocking everything. They, I mean, their, their motto was uh, uh, journalism, uh, irresponsible journalism. That was, I mean, it's on the cover. This is a, at the same time in the 1970s, there was another, um, many artists who were doing surrealist work, like Roland Topor. This is an artist I admire a lot, and, and uh, he did animation. He, he, he came from the surrealist movement. And in America, we have something, I mean, some artists were really tough, like uh, David Levine, he was very, great caricatures, uh, caricaturists, and, and this one was also, he had a hard time when they were, was published at The Nation. Uh, so you see, uh, Charlie Hebdo had this cover of a Muslim and a, and, and a gay, I think, I think it was like gay humor here, but with a Muslim. But it was being inspired in a previous cover they had from Harakiri about the students and the police when they had their, the, the, the movement in, 19, in the 1960s. And then the New Yorker also got inspired by this and they do the same. And this was also a controversy in, in, in the New Yorker. It also has been uh, having a lot of covers who create controversy. And oddly enough, the, the, the art director is from France. It's Francois Moody. Uh, so she has all these sensibilities, and, and uh, this was a, another very criticized uh, cover because this was after the first attack of the Twin Towers in 1993. So there was this kid uh, dressed as an Arab trying to, to destroy the Twin Towers, but uh, later on that happened. So this is another cover from the New Yorker when they, they switch, I mean, they, they intertwine the American way of life when we can all get together despite our differences or, or this is also another from Art Spiegelman <laughs> who's the uh, husband of, of and, uh, Francois Mouly uh, and this is the, the cartoon who created a, a major controversy I think after this one the offices were bombed uh, in 90 and in 2011 uh, this is, uh, I was in Paris in, in December, and this is the magazine who was on the newsstands. And I saw it, and I looked at it and said, do I want to buy this? It's not, <laughs> it's not really, this is like a sophomoric humor, like for teenagers, like you were saying. It's, but, I, but, it, but they have fun. I mean, they, they just keep doing it. So, and then this is the cover that uh, was made, I mean, was created by, by Luz after the attacks, uh, Charlie Hebdo, and he said that this is the Mohammed, he, he I mean, the, the prophet, he, he created as a cartoon, and he said he has like a, like a dialogue with his character, and, and that he told him he, he, everything is forgiven, and that he is like Charlie. So even in these moments, they, they have the humor is kind of a, like a, like an escape for them. It's, uh, and uh, now this is the kind of work that I do. I'm from Mexico. I, a lot of immigration and, and racial issues are are in my work. But not only that, I, I, I try to be universal. I try to touch all kinds of of, of news and 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 things that I feel. For example, there is a lot of human trafficking across the border, and and we. I mean, it's it's awful. I mean, so it it keeps it keeps just changing the, the face. And uh, so this is the kind of humor I do. I submitted to international competitions. This won this won an award in Mexico. Uh, this is another uh, image I did about the, the intervention in Iraq from America. The Library of Congress requested this this cartoon for their collection. Uh, these were cartoons I did about uh, when there were a lot of suicide bombers. And uh, 
I sometimes I try to sell them here, but they, nobody wants to buy them, so I, I sell them in Europe, and, and that's where I get more response sometimes for for this. And then not only, I mean, the women began to be, they became uh, suicide bombers as well. And then I play here with the, the Arab world, used to be known for its oil, now it's for its turmoil. Mm -hmm. So I, I make comments about politics, what's going on. Uh, this is in America with all the Ferguson and, and <laughs> the racial profiling. And so this I did after the, the Danish cartoonist was threatened uh, for his life. Uh, and, and also, uh, so it's like he's drawing the, the, the face of the prophet and violence is, is sparking out of it. Uh, right now it's going to be published in England because it's still uh, current. Um, and this is the, the cartoon about global warming that uh, Wolinski, he's, he was the jury, uh, the uh, how do you say, the um, yeah. main juror of, at the competition in Portugal. Uh, and this is the, the award that, that he gave me. And um, it's about the global warming. Of course, the, the bears are, are in, in extinction. I mean, in, in, uh, it's a species in, in extinction. And uh, so the mom is trying to, to save them. Oddly, uh, it, it's really interesting. Uh, Europe has a, a tradition of captionless humor. I tried to sell this cartoon here, and I couldn't sell it. I have to put a caption, and finally, the Reader's Digest bought it. The caption reads, we cannot stay here, we can no longer stay here, and your father has connections in China. <laughs> so <laughs> I tried to go for both markets, but not even, I, I, I even had an argument with the editor. Because, I don't know, he has his, <laughs> I mean, I have polis in the New Yorker, but sometimes they cannot publish everything, and maybe he didn't feel it was appropriate for them, but. <laughs> Uh, so this is Wolinski. That's where I met him in Portugal. He gave me my award, and I had the chance to to speak with him and, and be with him a couple of days. And uh, he was going to have a retrospective, and, and he invited me to come to his exhibition in France, in in Paris at the François Mitterrand. But the, he was really, I mean, the exhibition. There was a, 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 a small retrospective in Portugal, in Porto, of his work. And when I saw the work, I said, oh my God, this guy is really outrageous. He was really, uh, but at the same time, he was recognized in France for all his humor. He, I, I believe he was given the Legion of Award. Uh, so then when I, I went to Paris, and he, at that time, he told me if, if I wanted to send stuff to, I mean, to Charlie Edward was welcome. But I haven't seen the magazine in a long time. So when I was in Paris in December, that's the last thing I did before boarding the plane to buy the, the copy of Charlie Hebdo. And I saw the magazine and said, oh my God, this is not the humor that I, I, I do, but this is something really outrageous. And the next day I arrived in New York and the next day is the attack. So I was, when I saw his name among the, the people assassinated, I was really, really shocked. I was very angry and fortunately the media contacted me and I started uh, talking about Charlie Hebdo and freedom of expression because, I mean, whatever you do, you don't deserve to be killed in that in that manner. Uh, this is an homage I did uh, for Charlie Hebdo uh, right away. I mean, it, it, it blocks you, the, 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 the tragedy it makes you not to think, but I wanted something to come out of, of to do something, to, an homage to them. And uh, I, don't, I didn't bring the samples of the other cartoonists because I have to ask permission to all of them, but which is something that I'm doing. Uh, and I try to, I'm trying to organize an exhibition here, but many instances are not that uh, welcoming, but I, I, I want to pursue it. Right now, uh, many exhibitions were already organized. In Milan, uh, they already opened one on February 7th for the anniversary with about 300 uh, works. In Norway also, there's going to be another one. 
opening next month, and I was invited to talk there also. Uh, and then uh, in Colombia, they said, we want that exhibition. So it's going to be like an itinerant exhibition. In France, it's going to be another one at San Martel, San Jose de Martel, I believe. So there are many, many um, places who are already doing this worldwide. I hope to bring it to America, so I'll keep you posted. And uh, I think that's it. Yes. Thank you. Very much. there are nagging questions that did come up, but we didn't get to, we didn't go too far with them. I'm talking about suppression, uh, self-censorship, censorship, and I guess as an American, I'm talking about First Amendment, and seeing you welcomed it, uh, some people I read a great deal about who Oh, Sydney was very clear about saying that she, it's a question of taste for her and her limitations. I think you say really that you place those limitations on yourself. Well, I work for um, a, a mass market newspaper, both the Daily News and the Inquirer. It's a family newspaper, and our standards of uh, propriety are 1950 standards. You just don't show naked people, period. You don't have toilet humor. Um, it's, you know, in the days of HBO and girls and all that, we are, we are quite behind the times, but people, you know, that's, that's one thing we don't do. And um, I'm okay, I, I mean, mostly okay, I don't need that. It's not something that, that I want to do. The same way that Felipe said, you looked at Charlie Hebdo and said, well, that's fine for them. That's not what I do. But I do have a question on um, for Felipe uh, on Cine, Cine, uh, oh, that, Cine. The, who was fired. Mm -hmm. um, people have come to me and said, oh, well, Charlie Hebdo is, says it's, it mocks everyone, but then it fired someone for being anti-Semitic. Could you talk about that and say why that's okay? I think, uh, I believe there is a law in the, in, about freedom of expression in France in which you can criticize something very specific, but you cannot incite against the government, against that particular group. Uh, because there was also, one incident with a comedian who, who said, I'm not Jesuit Charlie, he said, this we one of the guys who yeah. yeah. uh, So that's, that's, the, that's the difference when you incite or support violence. I don't know the specifics of the CNES cartoons, but I, I know this is what happened. Yeah. But but the the accusation is mm -hmm. uh, if you're anti-Semitic, mm -hmm. you can't. Mm -hmm. uh, then you 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 get fired or mm -hmm. you, you, this the comedian got arrested. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. As opposed to anti-Muslim or anti-Christian. Mm -hmm. Yes. You, do you, do you I think it's uh, it has to deal with uh, what we call the uh, uh, call for hatred. If it's racist, it's considered as being a uh, hatred. And then you're not supposed to do that. Oh, mm -hmm. hatred. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's like you have the right to make fun or, or like blasphemy, for example. You can do that, but not against uh, uh, hatred or I mean, doing what you, what you were mentioning. For example, uh, at the same time, other countries uh, react in, in the opposite way. For example, right now, Iran is sponsoring a, car a cartoon contest against the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. because, and, and they are Holocaust deniers, and, and that's really horrible. And they did the same also when when the Danish cartoonists did that. So 
they counterattack in a different way and say, why are they doing this? I mean, hmm? yes, it, so it's really interesting how uh, another cartoonist friend of mine was suggesting that he said uh, maybe the, the, the radicals, they should start training cartoonists to do cartoons against <laughs> the West instead of killing them. So. Well, I have plenty. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I, I want to put off the questions, if I may, until our last speaker. Yeah. Uh, because Ezra opens up a whole new field to us, the one that has been nagging at me, as I mentioned before, and a very delicate one, which has to do with who suppresses who. Do we want to suppress the bad guys? And are the bad guys not allowed to speak on the internet? Well, they are. And we all know that. And we all know about what the bad guys do. But we don't know it as clearly as Ezra is going to talk about. Um, Ezra has an interesting history. <clears throat> she uh, is of Muslim and Indian descent and came to this country when she was four years old. She made her life here as a journalist, as many of us did, starting with our school papers what she did, and went on to, at 23, be an intern at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, she then later spent 15 years at the Wall Street Journal and uh, took, took a, a, a time out to write her book on her own search for identity. And uh, what she's going to talk about now is what she refers to as the honor brigade and what that is doing when Muslims criticize and threaten Muslims. And I'm going to leave it to Ashra to tell her story. All right, thank you so and much. And then we're going to have wider questions than we might have had otherwise. Right, thank you. I want to um, first just tell you all how much I admire you. I brought my 12-year-old son, who is my assistant, and um, well-paid, um, and I'm homeschooling him, so this is his class for today, so everybody asks more questions of him. But you all show so much courage. I think I've done so much in my life, and then I just hear what you all have done, and I'm just in awe. And so I wanted just to extend my appreciation to you. And you're so funny. You're much, more fun you're much funnier than writers are. We take ourselves way too seriously. But, you know, I um, will sh try to organize my thoughts with you on two levels. One is, you know, when you think a lot about trying to understand cultures, you oftentimes use this iceberg model. And so there's a lot of times things that you see above the iceberg and then a lot of stuff below the iceberg, right? So just taking my name as an example, my first name is Asra. I, it comes from a verse in the Quran, which is Surah Al-Isra. And it's a verb, and the A in it stands for God, a, a journey that God had um, the Prophet Muhammad <coughs> do from Mecca to Jerusalem, to where the Dome of the Rock is. So there wasn't TWA available at the time, and he supposedly made the journey on this winged horse. And I just, I tell you this story because there is this deep history of imagination and creativity inside of Muslim communities. It's the, it's the spirit that inspired me to become a writer, and um, it, 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 it informs itself in so many of the parables and the mystical tales that were told. And then my last name, Nomani, comes from the name of a scholar of Islam that created a school of law that is now the dominant school in South Asia through India and through Pakistan and Afghanistan. And I just mentioned that to you because it's so much within these codes of law that we have now inherited into the 21st century that you all have problems now when it comes from Muslim communities. Because those imams that came to you, they come to you from certain schools of law. Just like, you know, there's a Vatican that controls the talking points of the Catholic Church. These schools of law are very much what define what we can say and what we can't say inside of Muslim communities. So. I want to just ask you all, have you ever heard of these initials, OIC, right? Dawn has. What do they stand for, Dawn? The Organization for Islamic Cooperation. That's right, the Organization for Islamic Cooperation. 
It's an organization. You've heard of it? <laughs> Nodding your head. They were, they're the second largest organization in the world to the UN. So they have 57 entities, 56 countries, and then the Palestinian Authority now that are members, born in 1969. What had just happened in the Muslim world previously, in the a couple years before? 1967, the Six Day War, the war in Israel. The war that to many Muslims, they call it the War of Humiliation, right? Because they were summarily defeated and so from that war, this organization starts. It starts in Morocco. And it starts with this idea of defending Islam in the world. And so, I don't think you were even born then, right? No. Right, exactly. <laughs> Before your birth, there was this charter that was put in place. And you'll see, one of the items is what? What does it say, Steve? Protect and defend the true image of Islam, to combat defamation of Islam, and encourage dialogue among civilizations and religions. So the true image of Islam. So if I was to tell you, wow, there's true Christianity in the yeah. world, right? You're laughing, right? Because that's now we understand that there is not really. You know, one person's going to say homosexuality is a sin, and another's going to say that it's not, and that's true Christianity, true Juda Judaism. But this organization is formed with this idea that there's this monolithic, pure sense of what Islam should look like in the world. And defamation, when we usually think of defamation, who do you usually think of defamation against? Jews. Jews. Who else? Blacks. Blacks. Okay. And do you think of it what? Christian. The Christian. Do you think of it as being the against Greeks. do you think of it being against people? Is defamation to you against a people or an entity in that concept? It depends on the context of the sentence. Okay. So both for you. So in this context, they're talking about it not in terms of defamation against an individual, right, but defamation against the faith. Ideology. And the what? Ideology. And, and the ideology, exactly. But ideology, what are you talking about? There's only one true Islam. How dare you, right? That's where the problem begins because you are speaking the truth, of course. There are ideologies out there, just like my last name demonstrates. It's related to it historical context. Yeah, but historical context, we don't want any of that, okay? Wow. Uh, <laughs> I'm teasing. For about 2,000 years. I'm teasing. Is this, was this also the Sunnis and the Shiites? Sunnis, Sunnis, Shiites. I mean, this, this group then includes the Sunnis and the Shiites, interestingly. So because you have Iran in the, this group and Saudi Arabia. Now that's an interesting place to be able to meet, right? But what can you meet on? You know, what can those two very different countries with two very different sects, right, meet on? And it becomes this idea of defending the honor. And if you think about Muslim society especially, right? Abby, you know this too well. You've written such incredible stories about women who end up being what? Honor killing, killed by their fathers for speaking to a boy. <laughs> yeah. Um, killed by their father for speaking to a boy because then when you speak to the boy, what have you done? Dishonored. Dishonored, right. You've dishonored your family. You've dishonored the father especially because he couldn't keep that girl in control. And so that is such a fundamental part of our culture and our society. And I, I know it very personally because I grew up in this country, but um, the fact that I'm wearing this dress showing off, you know, these tights. <laughs> <laughs> radical, <laughs> radical, yeah. When I was eight, the rule was said that I couldn't wear any dresses except ones that were over pants. And so the idea of honor is below the iceberg. It's so seeped inside of our mind and our culture. And what you'll see there is this next point. In safeguarding the true values of Islam and the Muslims, the organization has taken various steps to remove misperceptions. So that is this fundamental mandate, you know, that goes beyond, you know, anything that those imams might even know, but it's something that they inherit when they come to visit you in your office in Philadelphia. And the ultimate idea is this idea of eliminating discrimination. Who doesn't want to eliminate discrimination, right? It's a, it's a noble concept, but when it comes down to how it gets expressed, that's when it becomes really tricky. 
so my assistant. December 2003, I found myself back in Morgantown, West Virginia, my hometown, after coming from Pakistan the year before, where I had gone to visit uh, my relatives and report on the event after September 11th. So a dear friend of my friend here, Dawn, and myself came to visit me in my house, um, a house that I rented in Karachi, Pakistan. And he was a colleague that you all will know uh, the name, Abby knows um, so well too, of Danny Pearl. And what, what, what happened with Danny? They killed him. He was the first of so many of us that had a, back, a, a target on his back. And what did they say that justified it was in part that he was Jewish and of Israeli heritage. That's when I had my wake up call personally that we had a problem with the interpretation of Islam that I saw being expressed. I came back home because I found myself pregnant in Pakistan without being married, which is always a lovely way to be in a country that um, makes it illegal. And so I decided to go on the pilgrimage to Mecca, and in Mecca, learned that women and men prayed together in the sacred mosque there. So I arrived back to our, our mosque in Morgantown, West Virginia, and was told at the front door that um, I couldn't go in through the front door. I was told, sister, take the back door. And I was summarily sent to the back door, but I came back and I decided I would go through the front door. I walked through the front door, and then I did something that made me really understand this issue of honor and shame in our community. I wrote about it. I wrote an article, an essay for the Washington Post. A man came to me afterwards from our mosque, and he met me at the Paneras in Morgantown, and he said, you've shamed the community. Stop writing. And of course, not just having half of the courage that you all have, I said, no, I will not. And I continued, and they put me on trial to be banned from the mosque, another act of humiliation. But these are the techniques inside of a community <laughs> that are successful in silencing people. What happened is, in the rest of the world, the Muslim countries were dealing with another shaming in their minds. In September 2005, these are cartoons that you'll be familiar with, but they, they did not publish in America, right? Uh, some, 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 some places some, did? Yes. The Danish cartoons. <clears throat> and there was an imam from Mr. Assistant. There was an imam from Denmark who went and took those cartoons hand to mosques. And he was the one who agitated people. He ended up becoming the repentant imam. You know the I story. Do, I do know the story. Because what did he decide? He decided that, that, that he couldn't, that he, that Islam was much broader, there were very many interpretations, and that he was being used by other right. um, people to foment the, the trouble. Right, to foment it. And so then you can see here from that image, what do you see his face in front of? What is it? Okay, exactly. Because that's supposedly you know the worst and most dirtiest animal, right? So there he is, humiliation with humiliation, right? This is the answer. But the organizations needed to do something even stronger. So just two months later, they had a meeting in Mecca, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, and they developed that month a 10-year strategy. So just think about it, it's December 2005, and they say we're going to have a 10-year strategy, and the seventh point is combating this concept of Islamophobia. So they borrow from the idea of racism. Remember the idea of discrimination? So Islamophobia ends up being literally then the fear of Muslims, right? But what they do is they then say that it's going to combat defamation. They're going to create an observatory. And I bet you guys are in that, in their little dossier. I hope so. Yes, and I love that you're so proud of it. I love that. Because what happened is two years later, in 2007, they end up assigning a young man, just graduated from AU Beirut, to basically document every grievance against 
publications related to Islam. And so you just literally go online, Google Islamic Observatory, Islamophobia Observatory, and you see the reports, monthly reports, and report after report. It's just like one one item, at, one transgression that we as writers or cartoonists have done, one after the next. And one other thing that they want to do, something that you should um, be interested in sitting here in New York City, is they wanted to go to the UN and pass an international resolution to counter Islamophobia. And not just counter it, but enforce punishment. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty serious stuff, right? And this is serious stuff for us as journalists, as creative people. But this was now their strategy. And so who, ironically, did they have as a sympathetic person was the Obama administration, ironically, because we talked a little bit earlier about how somehow liberals also end up sympathetic to these desires for censorship. It's a very ironic thing. I consider myself quite liberal, but this one confounds me. But I think what happens is the politics of race end up trumping a lot of liberal values that we typically associate with people who are liberal. And so in this cartoon, you'll see, the future must not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. So he, the, the um, President Obama said that he at the UN. And you'll see here, there's Iran, Ahmadinejad going, he stole the lines from my speech. But this is part of the challenge for uh, freedom of expression on issues in, in the U.S. also, and maybe not by law, you know, but by some sensibility. Like, be, be, and, and it doesn't have to be something that we get punished for or that becomes illegal, but like you said, the standard, you know, sort of the cultural standard of our day gets influenced by this. He's so happy, applauding, because this is realizing the vision and the hope of that 10-year that 10 year strategy that they had. And it continues because we have moments like Terry Jones down in Florida who said he was gonna burn the Quran, right? And what happened, we had troops, America had troops in Afghanistan. General Allen who was there said that this is gonna endanger the safety of our troops. So he went on TV in Afghanistan and said, Assalamu alaikum, you're respected friends of Afghanistan, we have meant you no harm. So what is what is the general doing as a strategy right there? He's sort of censoring, right? I mean, sure, it's not good form for Terry Jones to be burning the Bible, or the Quran or the Bible. Um, but he's they are doing their own sort of from the top down censorship. Okay. And the ideas then trickle down. You'll see this cartoon, 2020 vision. You can see the fear then is behead those who insult Islam. So you end up below the iceberg, you know, having this conversation with yourself. And maybe it's not even conscious sometimes, but you know, oh, it's going to be a it's going to be a pain of a day if I go out and, and take these risks. Go ahead, Chief. And finally, then. What I sadly see then is that the conversation doesn't always happen as it should. You know, what I would argue is that today, in 2015, this spirit, this culture of censorship, this culture of checking yourself, um, has caught, has made it so that in 2015, it's very difficult for us to talk in America about issues regarding Islamic extremism. You know, we have entire debates about whether or not the Islamic State is Islamic. We have entire conversations about whether we should have a, a conference on countering violent extremism or countering violent Islamic extremism. You know, this is the dance that we're playing right now. And I personally would advocate for the most honesty and the most clarity in our conversations, not ones where we are uh, fearful of offending others or where we even live with shame. Because the effect that a lot of this can have, especially I think on people who are more on the liberal side, is that they may feel like they have offended someone. And that's the last thing any good liberal wants to do, right? And so this is part of the dilemma in trying to have honest conversations. It's one that we're confronted with today, right now, and 
one that I am just so um, honored to be here with cartoonists who actually know how to do it well and how to do it with humor because ultimately I do think that that cartoon regarding the Muslims sitting around looking at the book of cartoons is the best way that we can uh, approach this so that we can get beyond the deadly seriousness of this and move on to really honest, smart conversations that we all need. So thank you so much for having me and thank you all for having me. Have a little time. We still have a little time for questions. And you have to excuse me if I just, I, I know many of you here, but I have very poor distance. So I just say, please speak up. And if you don't mind, or if you're willing, please give us your name and even your affiliation when you uh, go ahead. You're, you've had your hand up for a while. I'm Jessica Siegel. I teach journalism at NYU. And I am also on the board of the Deadline Club, and I know that we've had uh, emails together, which is very nice, so I'm very happy to be here, and I just want to compliment the panel of beautiful cartoons. Um, how does this um, fear affect uh, the, what is actually covered about uh, Islamic extremism? Um, I have read uh, I have read that, in fact, we have fallen, we journalists have fallen down on the job in doing proper coverage of Islamic extremism. So ISIS did seem to come out of nowhere um, and fear of actually reporting. So how does all this connect together? Well, yes. Well, I'd say one thing, I, I mean, ISIS, for example, is in the Middle East itself in a huge war zone, and it's, I think it, it's pretty, it's clearly hard to, to have uh, <laughs> Western um, reporters there, but, and uh, insofar as people who go into it are from uh, immigrant communities here and elsewhere, we also don't have really good sources in those communities, just like the government doesn't. And I think it's um, a par a partially incumbent on, on journalism to broaden the kind of people who are reporters, who are our reporters. Our, my, our newsrooms do not have Muslim uh, reporters uh, who might easily get into those communities and be more perhaps trusted. Um, and so, I, I mean, it's the same thing as, as uh, reporting in, in black communities about how, how they feel about Ferguson. We didn't, nobody saw Ferguson coming. Well, why not? You know, we, we are, we're inadequate in the way that, um, that we cover a number of different communities. That, that's one thing I, I would say. And, and by the way, American cartooning, quite, quite, quite male. Uh, cartoonists. Uh, it's a fraternity, and so I, I, I could have a special pass. <laughs> <laughs> but you did win. The yeah, I mean, it's a wonderful fraternity, and I love all the guys in it. I, I like the conservative ones. I like the liberal ones. I love them. It's a great group. It's just that it doesn't fully <laughs> represent all of America. More questions? Yes, please. Peter Schlager, uh, pro-Israel, Jewish, and <laughs> you know, you, I sorry, you, you, you show us all these wonderful things that the Muslims want to do, and then you've got this girl who gets beheaded, and the journalists get beheaded, and I think if ISIS had a chance, every single one of us would be converted to Orthodox. Islam. And I'm waiting actually, unfortunately, for the day that they're going to have somebody in Central Park grab a jogger, behead her in the name of ISIS. Now you're, you're, you're dealing with people that I think are, I, I can't say moon things. This is what they believe. Now, I don't know how you think you're going to convince somebody who is in ISIS that maybe they should get together with all the other Muslims and behave differently 
we think one way, they'll never think our way. And it's not going to happen. When you made a statement, but I'm wondering what your question was. I'm just, I'm commenting. You know, you're all up here saying the, the wonders of cartooning and cartoons don't kill. Well, they do. Because there are people who take an offense to it and act upon it. We saw it. And there are other people who are unhappy that, well, I guess it's, it's in Pakistan where, where the aid workers are, are giving polio shots and they get killed. There are beliefs. We're never going to change them. We have a set of beliefs, common sense and logic, and somehow other parts of the world should have our sensibilities and it won't happen. Can't happen. Yeah, my my opinion, it's not a question. My thought is that, um, you know, I love to uh, pretend like I have a PhD in psychology, but I don't. But I love to think about these kind of issues from a neuroscience perspective because I think that honor and shame sit in the back of the brain. And I think that a lot of the people who end up being very critical of cartoons and not having the imagination to be able to accept other people also sit in the back of the brain, either because of issues of, you know, being psychopaths or being, uh, you know, so traumatized or just having some ideology that just has made them lose their humanity to others. I don't have any illusion that anything that I do will appeal to them. They are sitting in victim culture. They're sitting with um, one concept that an FBI agent calls them as people who are wound collectors because what they do is just keep collecting the grievances that they have and use those grievances to foment further violence. So I have no illusion. I, I think that the work that cartoonists and others do, my hope and the work that I try to do is to appeal to the rest of society to actually take a position, to stand up, and to not be paralyzed by the fear that those people can have inside of our Muslim community, especially. My hope is to appeal to people's reason and to appeal to their ability to, um, to accept and embrace concepts like women's rights, tolerance, free speech, even the state of Israel. Like, what a concept. It's been around a few years now. I think we should go ahead and accept it rather than denying the, the existence of this state. And so there's so much that that um, we still have to do in mainstream communities that I think that this work is necessary to accomplish. Uh, more questions? Yeah, uh, my name is Gabriel Levico Gabla, I'm the cartoonist originally from Czechoslovakia. So I have a first hand experience of the censorship and uh, madness of controlling other people's mind. And I do believe that the conflict in the Middle East has to be done only between uh, the Muslims themselves. Uh, we are not going to either solve it or help them to, we might uh, for our, our help, but we're not going to solve this issue. Uh, in regards to anti-Semitic, I happen to be Jewish, my parents are survivors of all those. So uh, a few years ago, there was a, another cartoon exhibition in Tehran, in Iran, an anti-Semitic uh, exhibition. And there was a fantastic response by Israeli artists who established anti-Semitic uh, cartoons made by the Jews. And it's absolutely hilarious. Uh, so, but I believe that the problem that we're facing is now that the Muslim world, as it is today, has a problem. They didn't go through the periods as we went through, through the original, through Renaissance, through doubt, philosophy of doubting and disrespecting the authorities, and also a tradition in our data and surreal arts that really helps societies to open their mind and, and, and brought some fantastic art. So if they're not going to go through this, there's going to never be going to be a peace in the Middle East, that's for sure. And quite opposite, all these petty idiots with brain, brain, brainwash idiots would be having upper hand, not people who should be actually addressing this issue, which is a very, very serious issue, and the whole civilization and the Western world is at stake. The existence of the Western world, as we know it, is at stake. Yeah, I, I agree with what you said. I think, and this is what I see in, in historic terms, uh, because the Western civilization has gone through all that. I mean, Right now, I mean, I, I'm trying to understand Islam in the war and the conflict they have among themselves, the Sunni and the Shiites. And it reminds me the the wars between the Protestants and the Catholics. And I said, well, that happened like 
600 years ago, but this is going on right now. It was a revolution. Yes, it's a, it's a it's a revolution because even if you read the Ten Commandments, the Second Commandment, you cannot do a graven image. And but we already passed that. I mean, even in Islam, you were not supposed to to do uh, images. What they do, they do figures with texts. So there's always a loophole, and nothing is. I mean, the the world's still going on. I mean, Allah or God or whatever is not going to be coming and punish you because you're doing that. So, I mean, the humankind and the and the, and the way we, we think it's evolving in some areas of the world, but in others, is kind of going backwards or is stuck or or, or is being taken over by, well, unfortunately, with people with with terror and arms and. And ISIS, you were mentioning about journalists. They don't care about journalism because they, right. it's like they don't have any any yeah. sense of of, uh, of rights. That's a cultural, or rather, anti-cultural statement. Right? Yes, it's a. I mean, and it, and that happened even uh, recently with the Khmer Rouge. It reminds me of that. That the Khmer Rouge, they want to go back in time, destroy everything related to the Western world or civilization as we know it. And install a caliphate. I said, what is that? I mean, is that? <laughs> but that's the world. That that's why exactly they had to solve it by themselves. So can they progress? Mm -hmm. That's the strength. Yeah. Uh, I I will go back to your uh, criticism about cartooning. And after this, uh, you know, after Charlie Hebdo, there were a lot of cartoons uh, like Beto's uh, about you know the the pen uh, becoming a tree and you know. And I, I did one, uh, which I, of course, neglected to bring, because why would I on the Charlie Hebdo panel? But, um, you know, it, it suddenly occurred to me that, well, you know, if I were sitting there in a, um, you know, in a, a refugee camp in Syria, would I want a cartoonist <laughs> there? Uh, which is stronger, the pen or the sword? Well. You know, clearly the sword right now is is, is winning, and um, our our images of powerful pens are wishful thinking. However, in the long run, like I, I go back and I think a lot about Thomas Nast and those um, those the cartoon about the the um, Catholic priest coming out of the water. There were real issues at the time about um, what that immigration meant. Um, the, uh, the, they wanted, uh, the, there were issues about schools and whether the Catholic Catholicism would be taught in schools, et cetera, et cetera. So it was, it, it had a very real political um, uh, component to it. But, um, you know, I often wonder, well, if nobody, if they just said, okay, have your schools, go ahead. And, you know, would that have lessened the time that it took for Catholics to feel like they were part of our country? And clearly now, um, Catholicism is, you know, it's not considered a radical uh, religion in the United States. And, uh, you know, we have Catholics uh, all in the Supreme Court, many of them, and, and elsewhere, it's, it's just, it's not an issue. And I, what I hope is that someday that will be the same, that we can corrupt Islam too, and <laughs> bring them down to our American level. But um, the question is how, you know, how to do that in the United States. And I, I, I really don't think, um, you know, we have quite figured it out, but I, I think that we're doing a better job than, for example, France, where um, they're uh, much more marginalized and and less part of the society. I, I have an Algerian friend who is brilliant and very well educated, fluent in, in Arabic and French and English, and she couldn't get a job in a in a university in, in France. She couldn't rent an apartment under her own name because um, it was an Arabic name. And she's doing great in the United States. And and so I think that that looking at people as individuals and um, giving opportunity here will will lead to modernization here. I don't know about the rest of the world. And I totally agree with you. It's you know it's um, 
uh, in many of the cartoons I've done is about not intervening in those wars, which we're about to go off and do again. I think the best thing that happened was when ISIS killed the Jordanian pilot, all of a sudden Jordan goes, whoa, that's not right. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I was just going to make just a really quick point, um, a couple points, which is I actually, I, I just disagree. that I think that non-Muslims have a role, and that role is to put a mirror up to the Muslim community. And you all, especially in journalism and in, um, in the media, also have that role of a clear mirror because of issues of honor and shame. So often we don't honestly discuss our own issues. And just like the North, I know you're shaking your head, but it doesn't mean boots on the ground. It just means honest conversation so you don't tap dance and, and ignore things. Um, and the second point is just we have this concept of ishtihad. It means uh, it's an Arabic word that sounds like jihad, but it's a jihad of the mind, right? It's a critical thinking of reasoning. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do here in America is create a new school of law based on ishtihad, which is critical thinking. And that's something that is possible. And what does it trace back to? It traces back to the 10th century, when there was a group of people called the Mughazalites, who were reformers and, and artists mm -hmm. and writers. We had drawings, and, and, the and they got killed off. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. and they got killed the off. The the it's, it's, sure, it's all romanticized. And who cares now? It's not what we have. But just like you said, my dad came to this country in the 1960s on a USAID scholarship, and this troublemaker was born in this country. So <laughs> the it whole problem is that we are dealing with the Council of Religion, which is total. From the very beginning, I think Judaism is totally ridiculously invented human aspect. Yeah. You know what I mean? And how do you introduce this to people who will kill you if you would say God doesn't exist? In the way you think it does exist. Right. At least, I'm, I'm sorry that we are coming to an end. And I think we we all deserve one more question. But well, make it a question, please. <laughs> there have to be some clarifications here. Yes. Uh, would you agree? Uh, but uh -huh. we live in a democratic country, you know, founding our constitution, and every religious group has a right. To practice and to teach. You can't deny that. I mean, Quaker schools, great education, uh, Hebraic uh, institutions. Here in New York, that's terrific. Uh, the, the Catholic schools, some of the best educators are coming from these schools. You can't assess prejudice there. It's 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 a. I mean, it's in our constitution. You have the right to teach and you have the right to preach. But to to uh, use a how shall I say, uh, an aggressive uh, uh, personality in, in your cartooning, I think is almost insulting uh, in the way some of the cartoons are doing. And I would suggest that the cartoons, not only here, but in Europe, address the issue in a more basic, honorable, and succinct way, rather than in an oppressive, assaulting way. And I think that's important. And that gets to so many groups, including, you know, honorable Muslims around the world, although their issue is uh, interconnected and so difficult for us to convey because it's beyond our, 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 you know, our scope in this country. The gentleman there uh, so stated ISIS, but yes, there is a, 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 a vehement side to the Islamic religion that is progressing and providing and transgressing and resulting in these violent acts. So it is an internal, and I agree with my good friend here, that it has to be worked out internally for us to address it is a mistake. So I, I would I would consider that and perhaps you would also. Well, that's that's the final statement for this evening. <laughs> and now we get his questions. I think one question. So it, it is a question. It's a question for for the, the two cartoonists. I mean, I think we all agree. Uh, my name is Frederick Begin at this French study that I'm I think we all agree. Uh, we all in favor of the freedom of the press. 
uh, admitted, and we all agreed that the, the, the this crime was uh, horrifying. But I do have a question for you. Cartoons can be racist, sexist, insensitive, and and, and I wonder where, where 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 you stand when when you look at what Charlie Hebdo has been doing over the last thirty years, and what would be your own uh, limits? What 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 you would find insensitive? What it is that you would find, you know, that that that, that wouldn't make you laugh? And um, and uh, and what kind of humor do you find on the contrary more inclusive, more likely to make even those that you that, that you're trying to denounce love with you? Uh, I would say something. Uh, uh, for example, Charlie Hebdo, they they were in a financial trouble because of the kind of humor they do. It, it's something that we already know, or, or people already say, oh, that's it's like you just roll your eyes. That's when I saw the petit Jesus at all. I'm not going to buy it. So they were in financial trouble. But apparently, the only people reading this magazine were these radicals. And that's what they were getting in sense. I mean, it's like Hoster magazine. It's offensive, but I'm not going to buy it. If some people want to buy it, you go buy it and look at it. I mean, in a society, there has been a chance for everything. I mean, I was in Paris, and there was an exhibition of Sad, the, the, the Marquis de Sad. And I was like, oh my God, you don't want to see that? Don't go into that exhibition or don't read his works or whatever. I think there has to, they can be a, a, a chance for everybody. So, I mean, voices. There are books that are awful. I mean, I mean, even now the 50 gray, 50 what? Shades of gray. Some people are trying to boycott it because it's bad. I mean, you don't like it, don't buy it. And, and that's it. But you don't go and kill somebody for that. And also, don't impose your view, your radical view, because even going back to, to, to Islam and the Prophet Muhammad, I understand that's just an interpretation because he didn't want his image to be idolized like uh, like what happened in, in the Christian religion that uh, you have a lot of images, and, and he said, I don't want that. Only, I mean, in other ways, Buddha. I mean, Buddha didn't exist as an image. They, it was copied from Western art. Before there were pagodas, it was just for relics. Where in the year 700, with the Silk Road, the artists in, in Asia said, oh my god, this, uh, this religious images are beautiful. Let's start doing Buddha like that. And now we have all Buddhas all over the world. I mean, but it's, mm -hmm. And nobody is doing so idolatry or anything. It's, it's, and it's art. It's just sensibility. But, and I think, I hope Islam moves into that direction of openness instead of going backwards. It's, I mean, that was that's my point. <laughs> um, as I said earlier, I feel like I do have limitations. I, I don't draw, draw naked people. I don't do toilet humor. And I try, um, you know, I, as you can see, I, I over the years, I know what incites people. And so I take um, I take care on where I want to use things, but I don't want to ever have someone say, no, you cannot use that. That is beyond the pale because the person who's telling me that, it wants to protect themselves generally. And uh, some people just do not deserve protection. And I think uh, the ISIS crew are people who do not deserve protection from bad imagery. That's the least of the <laughs> problem. So that, that's what I would say on that. Well, no, I, but I, thank you for your really good yeah. good questions. Yeah, I have to great. say, this the, the questions that you asked are, are really much better than I've ever received on this issue. They're very personal, and um, they get they, they've gone deep into the problem, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.